Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Matt Lersch, and I am an assistant uh, principal at uh, Southbound High School. I'm, I'm the proud academy administrator for the Science and Technology Academy. Um, we appreciate everybody joining us here today for our first webinar uh, focused uh, on career and college exploration. And today our focus is on the health science field. Um, while so much of our life has changed um, and we have been thrown into upheaval and I know that our students, uh, things were kind of flipped upside down, uh, it's important that we do um, continue to maintain the sense of normalcy and that includes connecting and uh, being able to continue to learn um, and plan for the future. And so um, we are really happy to, to bring some college and career resources to you today that will hopefully help you plan for success after high school. So today's um, conversation um, is with some industry leaders and education partners. Um, and we hope that you gain a stronger understanding of various health uh, career college pathways, uh, specifically in pharmacy, nursing, and biotechnology. So uh, to quickly review uh, today's agenda, we're gonna begin with remarks from our partners um, at the Greater Phoenix Chamber Foundation um, and Casey Quinones will share updates about the foundation's Elevate Ed program. Then we will hear uh, four 10 minute presentations from each of our experts. Um, each expert will provide us an overview of their industry and areas of expertise. Uh, after we he have heard from all four of our speakers, we'll move into a Q&A session um, and give our students an opportunity to ask questions of our industry partners. And you may submit questions via the uh, Q&A box, the, the chat box, uh, sorry, the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we will do our best to answer them um, until the end of our session. We will attempt to get through as many questions as possible, um, but uh, we recognize that we might have many coming in. Um, and so again, thank you everybody for joining us today. It's now my privilege to introduce Casey Quinones from our webinar partner, the Greater Phoenix Chamber Foundation. Um, Casey is the college and career coach uh, for Elevate Ed AZ. Welcome Casey. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate that introduction. Um, so hello everyone. My name is Casey Quinones and I'm the college and career coach for Elevate Ed AZ. So Elevate Ed AZ is the education initiative of the chamber that is connecting business and education. So whether you decide to enroll in college or enter the workforce, Elevate Ed AZ will make sure that you get the experiences to help you succeed in school and beyond. Um, now my role as the college and career coach for Elevate Ed AZ is to support you in achieving your goals. Um, so we'll have the opportunity to work together to help you explore career pathways that relate to your talents and interests, connect you with employers in your industry, and also cheer you on as you build the confidence to succeed in your future. And I will also help support teachers by ensuring that they have the resources they need to give you the valuable opportunities that will prepare you for life after high school. Um, I really look forward to working with all of you in the upcoming school year to help you explore college and career options. Now, before I hand it back to Matt for our presentations, let's go ahead and have some fun. So what I'm going to ask everyone to do at this time is open up a separate web browser, whether you're on your phone, computer, tablet, um, and you're going to go to www.menti.com and type in the code 383280. And at that time, you're going to be able to answer our first question of the day, which is what do you plan to do the first two years after graduation? Are you going to continue your education at a trade school, college, or university? Are you going to use the credentials you graduate with to launch your career? Or are you going to continue your education and launch your career at the same time? So you'll be able to see the answers pop up in real time. As you can see, we have 100% of our participants that are going to continue their education after high school. We'll give you about another minute to go ahead and go to menti.com and use that code 383280. All right, we have a couple of people that are going to do both, start their education as well as launch their career. Go ahead and give you 30 more seconds to get that answer in. 
Oh, it looks like a couple more people have responded. We still have the majority that are going to continue their education, but we also have some folks that are going to do both, continue their education and launch their career. All right, awesome. Well, it looks like um, we have some responses that came in. So thank you so much for participating in that first question. Make sure you do keep this browser open because we are going to have several questions throughout the rest of the presentation. Um, so hopefully that was a fun chance for you to get involved and engaged. And I'll go ahead and kick it back to Matt for our presentation. Thank you, Casey. It's, I'm glad to see that our Jaguars will be pursuing um, college and career after they complete their time with us at South Bend High School. Now, I am pleased to welcome our first speaker, Shelby Cato, a Talent Acquisition Manager with CVS Health. She will discuss what a career as a pharmacy technician looks like um, within the organization. Thank you and welcome, Shelby. Thank you, Matt. I'm very excited to be here today and speaking to all of you about the careers within pharmacy, um, both for high school students and beyond. So um, on our next slide, just a brief introduction of myself. Like Matt said, I am Shelby Cato and I'm a talent acquisition manager for CBS. It's kind of a fancy word for a recruiting manager. Um, so we spend a lot of our time recruiting students on campus to be pharmacy interns and student pharmacists for us for after they graduate. Um, so today I'm gonna briefly go through a little bit about CVS Health in general and some available career paths within CVS. Um, some roles for those of you wanting to enter the workforce right away after high school, and then also some career opportunities for those who want to pursue higher education. Um, and then finally, we'll go over some successful traits um, that you guys would need to, um, to be great uh, employees with CVS. So if we want to go to the next slide. Um, so a brief overview about CVS. So I'm assuming most people here know who CVS is. Um, we're on almost every corner. Um, and I'm assuming probably a few of you get your prescriptions from us as well. So CVS Health is uh, located in all 50 states, as well as the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. And we have over 10,000 stores. Um, a fun fact is that 95% of the population in the United States lives within five miles of a CVS store. Um, so we are pretty, pretty well known around the United States, um, and we are the largest retail pharmacy chain within the country. Um, and we serve 4.5 million customers every single day. Um, I think that number probably has gone up recently with our COVID-19 um, situation that we've been in. Um, our stores have been extra busy um, as of late. So in terms of career opportunities for pharmacy technicians, um, I think it's a perfect job for a student in, in high school or um, a recent high school graduate. Um, so to be a pharmacy technician, you have to be 16 years old. Um, and then we do look for students who either have a high school diploma or are currently enrolled in high school or have an equivalent degree. Um, compensation for our pharmacy technicians start off at $13 an hour, but that does increase every year you get merit increases and then that can also go up in terms of your performance. Um, for career growth within the pharmacy technician, um, there's a lot of different things you could grow your career to, to be a lead pharmacy technician, to be um, an operations manager, um, and really grow your career if, wanting, if you're wanting to be a pharmacy technician um, as a career path for yourself. Um, but a lot of other things that can lead into um, a career with CVS outside of just being a technician is to be an actual pharmacist. Um, if we go to the next slide, So um, being a pharmacy technician is a great career path, but it's also a really great stepping stone into becoming a pharmacy intern and also a, a pharmacist. Um, so if you are thinking about becoming a pharmacist down the road, um, the great first step is to become a technician, get your feet wet within the industry and really understand the ins and outs of being um, of what it's like to work within a pharmacy. Um, once you enroll in an actual school of pharmacy, you would then get promoted to a pharmacy intern. Um, our intern program is very robust and we actually have our students pharmacy interns working through us throughout the year. So it's not just a summer internship, it's throughout the entire year. So that way you're taking your real world um, experience that you're learning in the pharmacy and you get to apply the knowledge that you learn in the classroom. And um, so we find that it's a really cohesive program to be in pharmacy school and also pr practicing those skills um, within our pharmacies inside CVS. Um, 
her goal of having pharmacy interns is to promote them eventually to pharmacist after they complete school and pass their board exams. Um, so compensation for a pharmacy intern starts off at 14 15 an hour, um, but that does also increase with every year of schooling that you obtain. Um, so becoming a or getting into pharmacy school um, can be a bit of a challenge. It is a competitive program. Um, most pharmacy schools don't allow you to enter in directly out of high school. You have to have at least two years of undergraduate schooling and to get your, your prereqs done. Um, and then you have to apply to pharmacy school and you actually have to go through an interview process. Um, now, what looks really, really good on your interview is if you have some pharmacy experience already under your belt. So that's where that pharmacy technician role comes in. So if you're able to get a couple years of being a pharmacy technician experience, you'll be able to really advance your resume and have really great skill sets that you can talk about during your, your um, interview to enter into pharmacy school. So most pharmacy programs are three to four years in length. Um, they are very robust, it is a doctorate degree. Um, so it's not exactly an easy program, but it is very rewarding, especially for those who are interested in science and math. Um, over the course of the, the four years in school, you'll learn um, all the skills needed to be a great clinician. Um, and then once you graduate, you would take your exams and then become a pharmacist. Um, so pharmacists start off with CVS at about $50 an hour, um, give or take a little bit, depending on where you're at within the country. Um, and there's so much room for growth from there. Um, you're in charge of running the pharmacy, um, filling prescriptions, working with patients, and also overseeing technicians and interns who work in your stores. So we trust that while you're in pharmacy school, you will get the necessary knowledge needed to be a great clinician. Um, we know if you pass your exams, you have the knowledge needed to be a successful pharmacist. Now the skills needed to be successful within a CVS pharmacy are a little bit different. Um, we ask a lot out of our pharmacist and the main things that we look for are strong communication skills, great customer service, and a strong sense of leadership. If you go to that communication piece, you are, we call it, um, if you're the pharmacist in the pharmacy, you are the quarterback. So you're directing every other player on your team as to how to be successful and run a successful pharmacy. Um, the customer service piece is huge because you are interacting with the public on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, they say that pharmacy is the most accessible healthcare provider. Um, most of us can't just walk into our doctor's office without an appointment and ask them questions about our medications or how we're feeling. But in a pharmacy, you can. You can walk right up and ask our pharmacist and, and it's very accessible to our patients. So we need people who have great customer service skills and are really passionate about interacting with their community. And then finally, it's leadership. Um, you are the leader of the pharmacy, whether you're the pharmacy manager or the staff pharmacist. When you're the pharmacist on duty, you are in charge. Um, so we like students who are excited for leadership opportunities and are really willing to grow that skill set in order to be successful. We can go to the next slide, Brittany. So out here, I, I outlined a, a typical career path um, for somebody who wants to start off within the pharmacy industry. Um, so the first natural step would to become a pharmacy technician. Again, you can do it at the age of 16 while you're in high school, you know, working part-time night and weekends just to kind of get your feet wet and understand is pharmacy really a career path for you? Um, if you decide it is, the next natural step would be to become a pharmacy intern after you enroll in pharmacy school. And then once you graduate and pass your exams, you would move into a pharmacist position. From there, the options are really endless, um, especially if you kind of also have an interest in business and management. Um, working with a really large company like CBS, we have a lot of opportunities for growth within our company. Um, you can become a district leader, which uh, oversees about 15 to 20 CBS stores located within a certain geographic area. From there, you become a region director that oversees an entire region. So for example, in Arizona, our region director covers, um, I think, 10 states of, of, of um, of CVS stores. So there's a lot of growth opportunity and with a, a corporate company like CVS, you're able to really take your career wherever you want to go. So you can start in pharmacy and then decide maybe you want to get into more of the business side, or maybe you want to be a pharmacist forever. And that's great too. Um, going back to the fact that we have locations all over the United States, it's really, um, I would say a huge advantage because life takes you a lot of different places. So you guys might be in Arizona now, but maybe you wanna to move to Texas or California or Rhode Island, wherever it might be. You're able to move um, for your personal life, but also keep your career with CVS and transfer between different stores. Um, we do that all the time. 
um, to have our keep our pharmacists with us no matter where life takes them geographically. So um, I, I know I've talked a lot about the different career paths that are available. There are so many more that I didn't have the time to touch on today. Um, but being a pharmacy technician is a really great starting point and also a really great career to have within the industry. Um, pharmacy, especially right now, is so important with COVID-19 and what's happening within our, our country and our world right now. We really are the frontline workers and, and the first line of defense for this disease. And um, it really, I think, right now has highlighted how important it is to have really great workers within our pharmacy and how much of an impact you can make on your community. So um, I hope you guys consider a career within pharmacy. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them later within the Q&A. All right, thank you, Shelby. Um, so uh, next we have another question for our participants. Um, so what excites you most about uh, healthcare? Uh, helping people, the chance to innovate, or a security for your, for your future, just knowing that you're gonna have a, be able to have a job and, and provide for your, for your family. All right, we've got a bit of a split here to start. Now's a perfect split. Thank you to all those that are submitting their answers. Another couple seconds here. All right, it looks like helping people is, uh, is whoop, now we're fast paced responses. All right, looks like we've got a split here between helping people and have a, having a secure future. Um, thank you for your responses. Um, I'm now pleased to welcome our second speaker, Megan Majors from Bandera Medical Group. She will discuss what a career, uh, uh, the career path for CNAs looks like. Welcome, Megan. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you students for uh, allowing me to speak to you today. Um, my name is Megan Majors. I'm a director of recruitment and retention for Ensign Services, which is our parent company. Um, and I, I've been in the industry for over 15 years and with Bandera and Enzyme for six. Uh, so I've, I've definitely seen the, the ups and downs of healthcare, but there is definitely some stability in this. Uh, next slide. Um, so I just wanted to kind of share a little bit about, you know, who we are. Uh, we are a national organization. Um, we have 225 facilities uh, nationwide and uh, 31 here in the state of Arizona. Um, we offer skilled nursing uh, facility services, which is generally working with the adult and geriatric population. Uh, next slide. So um, in, in our facilities, which range anywhere from 50 beds um, to 200 to 300 beds, um, we offer um, post-acute care, which is more short-term rehabilitation care and long-term care for adults and geriatric population. Um, so if, if you enjoy working with adults and the elderly, um, this is definitely a setting that uh, you would have the opportunity to make an impact with that population. Um, in addition to um, in-house care, we also do have um, other parts of our organization, which is mobile x-ray and labs, uh, non-emergency transport for um, medical purposes, um, and other consulting services. And then we also have um, the Pennant Group, which uh, is, is a spinoff of Ensign. Um, it just spun off in October, which offer assisted living services and home health and hospice. Um, so we're working with all different varieties of, of healthcare. I think the only you know, avenue we're not in is urgent care and hospitals at this point. Um, so there are a lot of different ways that you can get into healthcare. Um, you know, the non-clinical opportunities are certainly there. So if, if 
providing patient care is not something that interests you, um, there's so many other things that you can do. Um, we have activities, so you know, trying to provide um, you know things for our patients to do while they're in our facility because they are with us 24/7, and so being able to you know play bingo or is, is always kind of what you hear. Um, but you know, doing arts and crafts um, right now um, because of our current environment, our patients can't have visitors and and so that's really difficult for them and so right now we're having to provide other avenues for them to have uh, communication with the outside world and so you know providing opportunities for them to FaceTime with their families and their friends um, and, and other activities that are a little bit more um, in their rooms and it's it's truly just for their their safety and their health at this point um, business office um, medical billing is another avenue that you can take um, admissions and and marketing if if you like to be out and you know meeting with different people um, out in the community that is a great uh, direction to go um, social services and case management um, you know making sure that the patients are getting um, the care that they need while they're in our facilities, but also after they leave our facilities, um, whether it's going home or assisted living or um, independent living, uh, we want to make sure that they are transitioned safely, uh, whatever that looks like. And then dietary and housekeeping um, is another avenue that you can take. But the clinical pathways is definitely what I wanted to spend majority of the time talking to you guys about is um, you know, this is where you can, you know, sky's the limit. Uh, there's so many stories in house uh, within Enzyme and Bandera that I could share. Um, but we have so many folks that, you know, started as hospitality aides or CNAs or even dishwashers that are now directors of nursing and, and running an operation of their own uh, from a clinical perspective. And um, it's, it's always really fun to just see them grow. Um, and, and the organization helps them get to that point. Um, and so hospitality aids um, is, is definitely something that doesn't require um, education, and, um, but it does require you to be 18 um, to be able to, to do this. You're there on the floor. Um, there's so many things that our, our residents or our patients um, need that don't require uh, a clinical expertise or background. Um, you know, so even if it's providing just um, companion care, you know, talking with patients, um, you know, getting them ice and, and water and um, things like that, it's, it's incredibly helpful for our nurses and our CNAs. Um, they, they truly appreciate the support of hospitality. It's, um, in addition, it's really nice for you to get into the facilities um, and see if you enjoy it. Um, you know, the education that goes into becoming a nurse, um, you know, it's, it, it's a, a, you know, four years for, you know, an RN, a BSN, um, five weeks for CNA, um, most LPN, it's about two years. And so, you know, before you, you know, set yourself into that career pathway, it's kind of nice to get an idea. Do you like this setting? Um, do you like the industry? And so this is a great way to do that. And right now our organization is actually hiring temporary hospitality aides um, for this reason, really, to see if you like it. Um, and if you want to pursue it, we would like to help you move forward and, and continue this pathway. Um, MDS nurses um, is, is another part of the nursing industry where you can uh, work closely with um, making sure that, you know, we're tracking our, our falls, um, you know, anything to do with the patient care, but it's more on the back end. Um, and then there's unit managers um, is another part of that pathway. And, you know, helping um, out on the floor, um, making sure that things are running smoothly, um, and being a support to your fellow nursing staff. Um, one thing that I'm really excited about with our organization is the Director of Nursing and Training Program. Um, we meet monthly, um, under normal circumstances, I should say, we meet monthly and um, provide uh, regular training on not just to how to lead a nursing team, but how to be a leader in general. Um, 
you know, just because a, you know, someone's a great nurse uh, doesn't necessarily position themselves for a great DON. And so we really try to make sure that they have the skills that they need um, to get to that point. And so we, we have a six months to year uh, long program while they're working in a facility um, and, and also going to multiple different buildings within our 31 uh, facilities that we have here in Arizona just to make sure that they they know how to turn something that might be struggling into something great. Um, our organization has some very unprecedented uh, clinical results in the state of Arizona. Um, one of our facilities just celebrated uh, four not, um, deficiency free surveys um, and that's our annual survey that we receive every year. Um, and that's just unheard of. And a big part of that is because of the clinical um, support and, and care that we are giving. And so if you're interested in kind of getting into that um, avenue, it's, it's a great organization to do that. Uh, next slide, please. So we are working closely with um, the Arizona Healthcare Association. Um, and I'll just share a little bit about this. Um, and, and why we're really kind of pushing this, this need. Um, I am on the workforce committee with, with ACA um, and some others, and we established that in early 2019. Um, there's already a shortage of CNAs and nurses in the state of Arizona, but we anticipate there's going to be a shortage of 50,000 nurses by 2030, and it could be even more. Um, COVID-19 is really um, scaring a lot of folks um, out of the industry, really. And, and so we we're having to kind of backfill um, the folks that, um, you know, for, um, you know, their personal reasons are, are deciding to, to exit the industry. And so this is even more of a difficult time for, for us to find staff uh, for this population. And we're already anticipating um, the, the population that is going to be needing post-acute care is, is going to be even greater um, in five years. So the, the gap is, is going to be bigger. Um, we're, so the mission of, of the committee is just to drive interest, um, especially to, to high school students that um, are exploring what they want to do. And um, you know, we wanna provide those resources um, that are available to you. Next slide. So I'd like to encourage you to um, check out uh, one of the websites that we have. Um, it's careforthaging.org, and it's it's something that we partnered with ACA with, um, and and it's an opportunity for you to kind of dive into the individual opportunities within our industry, and um, also you know providing you with the different um, resources on where you could start. Um, you know, from an educational standpoint, uh, what schools are close by, um, what facilities are hiring, um, what would the pathways look like for a CNA. Um, the state of Arizona is starting to do certified medication aids, and um, that's something other states do, but we are starting to do it again here in the state. So that's a, that's a growth opportunity, even within the CNA. Um, position. So that, that's just definitely something I would recommend checking out, um, kind of go in and out, see what your interest is. So um, I will turn it over to, to you. Thank you so much for that great information. All right, we have a little bit of trivia. Um, how many careers require college or technical education after high school in Arizona? So let's see how we do on trivia. Is it 30%, 68%, or 95%? How many careers require college or technical education after high school in Arizona? All right, 68% is starting to take the lead here pretty handily. So yeah, so that is the correct answer. So 68% uh, of our careers require college or technical education after high school in Arizona. So that's a, a, a need, a, a must, a requirement as uh, students, you're leaving high school to continue your education beyond. Um, so thank you for, for responding to that. 
Next up, um, we have um, Sarah Finch. Um, Sarah uh, is from the Phoenix Police Department. Um, she's going to be talking about careers in biotechnology and the Phoenix Police and what that looks like. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Like you said, my name is Sarah Finch, and I work at the Phoenix Police Department Crime Lab. Um, I'm a forensic scientist here. I've been here for a little over six years. Um, and in my section, um, I process items of evidence for fingerprints and biological material. So uh, just a little bit of um, background though of what we do here as a lab, since it is a forensic lab, you have to know what forensic science is. And it's not just your typical science, it's actually the application of science to the law and to items of evidence that have come from crime scenes. So we're looking at these evidence, um, piece of evidence, we're testing them, we're analyzing them, we're evaluating them, but we're also helping officers and detectives as well as lawyers answer questions about the case itself. Um, who did something? How did they do it? Um, possibly a timeline type of thing. Um, there's a lot of questions that we try and answer with the science of it, but we analyze the evidence and then give objective answers to them. Um, so it takes a lot of different types of sciences though in um, the lab itself. Some of it is hard science with chemistry and biology and some of it is more applied science. So next slide please. So a lot of people may have heard of the show CSI. It's not really that popular anymore but there are crime shows out there and what you have is CSI versus reality. What happens on TV versus what we actually do here in the lab. So um, it doesn't take an hour to solve a crime. Most of the time, if not probably 95% to 99%, it takes longer than an hour to analyze one item of evidence. So um, that's one thing that's different. And also it's very much a team approach versus one person. A lot of times on TV, you have one person doing the whole analysis of one whole case. That's not very typical unless you're a very small rural, rural lab and you don't have many sections. Here in Phoenix, we're the fifth largest city and we have a very large um, lab and we have many different sections. So you're an expert in your section, you won't do all the analysis. Um, and many of the times, forensic scientists are not police officers. We're not sworn, we're actually civilian. There are some agencies that have police officers that analyze evidence, but we in Phoenix do not do that. We are um, civilians. Next slide, please. So these next couple of slides are just examples of how um, reality versus what you may see on TV, how it actually fits in and what we actually work with. So the middle picture is a picture of um, a photo room that we use in my section actually. So that's how we're looking at the item of evidence and taking pictures of fingerprints. So it's a copy stand with lights and um, a really expensive camera with some filters. It's not super high tech. It's, it's a nice camera, but we're using uh, regular things. On the far right is a comparison microscope that they use in firearms to look at casings and markings um, that firearms have caused on bullets or the casings of a bullet. Next slide, please. This slide shows the difference in lightings that um, we use. Now, some of the lights that you see on TV, we actually use, they're just not shown correctly on TV versus how we use them. So a lot of times you'll see like the bottom left, um, it looks like a blue light and he has that little orange filter over it. You do need the orange filter to see what the light is shining on, but we wear goggles. So we wear orange goggles to actually see it because that light is typically very intense and it can damage your eyes. And a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff will glow, but not everything. Blood doesn't glow, which a lot of times they show it on TV like that. But um, the, the far right pictures, um, are actually what we use. So the bottom right is what we call polylight, and it has different colors of um, light that we use. It's different wavelengths. And we'll look at a piece of evidence and look at all these, um, look at it with all these different wavelengths and the colors of light. Next slide, please. 
So to become a forensic scientist, you do need to have your bachelor's degree. Now you can get your bachelor's degree in a hard science like bio, um, biology, chemistry, um, biotechnology, um, or forensic science. Um, the main thing that they're looking at is your um, science credit hours. So some forensic science programs don't actually have a lot of science credits. So um, if this is a career that you're looking at, just make sure you're looking at the whole program and you're looking to see the science involved because you need those in order to become um, a forensic scientist. And it depends on what section you want to work on in. Um, some sections have specific requirements. To work in a DNA section, um, you need to take uh, biochemistry, molecular biology, genetics, and statistics. Those are required um, for accreditation purposes. So any lab that's accredited will most likely have these classes that need to be taken. So just be aware of um, what section you want to work in and what may be required. Um, here in Phoenix, we do offer tuition reimbursement. If you um, wanted to continue your education, many people here at the lab have um, acquired their master's degree and had the city pay for it. Um, I took a graduate certificate program online and it was paid through paid by the city through the tuition reimbursement. Um, also, not only do you need your um, degree, there is an extensive background check, a polygraph, and a drug test that you must pass in order um, to work for the Phoenix Police Department. Next slide, please. So some of the general duties that we do as scientists, and this is very broad, um, not section specific, but um, we're looking at the items of evidence collected from a crime scene. We're gonna analyze those. We're gonna write a report on what we found and um, on the item, what our analysis, um, what the conclusions were. And then we may be called to court to testify on these conclusions. It's not all the time that we go, um, but it is, you will go at least once in your career, I'll say that. Some sections go many more times than others. Our toxicology section goes the most, um, and then the other sections, it declines from there. Um, so a question of what can you do to help yourself become a forensic scientist, um, get into college, um, study a science or forensic science, um, keep, a, keep a clean record. You wanna be able to pass that uh, background um, check and um, the polygraph and everything. Practice public speaking. When we have to go to court, we are trying to educate the jurors on what our conclusions are. And to do that, you can't be scientific um, to a high level. You need to put it in layman's terms and you need to explain it that um, a regular person pulled off the street can understand it. So we have to um, translate our reports and our scientific analysis into layman's terms. And also I would um, encourage volunteering or interning at a lab. Um, most labs, of our lab here at Phoenix, you have to be at least 18 years old. We do have a program with the Phoenix Police Department that students can um, have an internship here at the lab, um, but you can also just be a volunteer. You don't necessarily have to be enrolled in school to be a volunteer. Next slide, please. So these are some of the services that we provide at the crime lab. Um, and these are the sections, I should say. Um, crime scene response, they're the ones that actually go out to the scene, gather the evidence, take the photos, um, do any drawings that need to be done of the scene itself, and then come back and impound the evidence. In, at Phoenix, they do not analyze any items of evidence, they are simply going to the scene, bringing it back and impounding it. The other sections actually analyze. Firearms, um, they mainly deal with firearms. They're doing test functions, looking at cartridges and, and bullets, different things like that. Toxicology, test blood and urine for any blood, um, for alcohol or drugs, excuse me. Control substances, test the hard drug or the actual drug itself. Um, our trace section is kind of a catch-all, and it does a lot of different tests, anything from looking at um, fibers and paint to um, 
gunshot residue, um, arson cases, they're kind of the catch-all. If it doesn't fit into the other sections, it goes to trace. Um, late prints does the actual fingerprint comparison. So if I were to take a picture of a fingerprint, I would send it to late and print comparison section, and they're gonna look at the info that's provided and try and identify that fingerprint to maybe somebody in the, in the case itself or to the other comparison subjects that they have. Evidence screening is my section, and we, like I said, analyze for fingerprints as well as um, testing and collecting biological material. And then forensic DNA, they um, take DNA samples and try and develop a profile from them. Next slide, please. Um, some of the positions that we offer here at the lab, a laboratory technician is basically the starter position. It's the, the lowest level, and then it goes all the way up to our crime lab administrator. Um, so crime scene specialists, uh, you have levels one, two, and three, and they work in um, crime scene response unit. They also have shift, shift supervisors, excuse me, excuse me, and then section supervisors. Then forensic scientists are in all the other sections and that has four levels. Um, each section has their own supervisor. Um, and then we have uh, a, two assistant quality managers actually, and then three assistant crime lab administrators and one crime lab administrator. Next slide, please. So this is just a range of the wages. Um, because we work for the police department and ultimately we work for the city of Phoenix. This is public record. Um, the only thing though, I have an asterisk at the bottom um, wage and that's because this position was actually a sworn position. It was um, a, an officer that had this and I'm not sure if that has been updated to a civilian um, title as far as wages yet. So that's why the asterisk is there. Um, this was kind of a general picture of it. But these are the ranges that um, these positions can earn. Next slide, please. So some of the skills and attributes that you um, need and that we're looking for here at the crime lab. Um, one of the things, and this is where your biotechnology um, classes and what you're learning in your in this program this is where this all takes where you put it into practice so um, we're looking for ethical people we work for the police department so it's kind of understood that we need to be ethical but it goes beyond that you're going to court and you're testifying on your cases and your findings and you're um, you're basically you what you analyze you could the results could send a person to jail or it could exonerate them. So ethics are a big, big thing here. Um, team oriented, like I said at the beginning, it's not um, one person doing all the work. It's very much a team aspect. Public speaking skills again, um, detail oriented. So a lot of the stuff that we look at is small and we're trying to find hairs and fibers and look at fingerprints at different angles and um, the fingerprint itself. So paying attention to detail and um, small items is very important. Um, another thing is having a passion for science and helping people. Um, from the answers of the previous questions, I can see that you guys are already um, passionate about that but this is just another way of showing it and kind of um, growing that passion that you may have. Um, you must be willing to learn and be adaptable also. Um, things change a lot in the world of science. Things are always improving, um, but then you could have something that typically you process it one way and for whatever reason, you need to adjust your process for this item. So it's, most of the time it's cut and dry, but there will be times where you have to learn and adapt to different things. Um, I put photography on here as a skill. If you have it, that helps depending on what section you go into, but it's not required. 
Um, and then any lab experience. Your school, if you work for a lab at the school, if you um, work for a lab, um, a private sector, anything like that, any experience that you have um, kind of puts you a little bit over the edge. So relating your biotechnology learning, so what you're learning in your classes. Um, remember your laboratory skills and your safety. You're, um, ultimately, you're coming out of a, a classroom setting with all the lab skills and coming into this lab should you get a job here. So just remember all those and bring them into practice. Um, safety is key. Um, we have clean techniques in our lab, so we're using um, a PPE and we're cleaning with bleach um, to not contaminate the items. So just remembering those different skills that you learned in your classes. Critical thinking and problem solving is very important. Um, each case is treated individually and you have to look at that case and see how you need to process that item. Um, pull in your lab classes and examples um, for your interviews. That's really important and there's actually a lot of applicants that don't do it and we're always surprised because that is your experience. If you don't have a job, that is your experience. So pull those in for interviews. Um, if you did any research projects in your lab, um, whether they be independent or a group, really expound upon those in, in the interview. Say what your role was, what the outcome was, what you learned, and how um, was it beneficial? Did you learn from it? Um, could anything be better? Um, any SOPs? So I'm sure you had to follow SOPs in your classes and your lab settings. Here, it's just as important. It's actually very important because we follow our SOPs to keep our accreditation and that's how it's lined out of how we analyze the items of evidence. So following SOPs is very important. Um, and then stay up to date on technology and literature that's out there. Um, in biotechnology, a lot of times um, you may have some research stuff that you've either done or that you're interested in. Um, sometimes that can correlate to forensics. There's a lot of uh, change that's happening right now with forensics. So just staying up to date, if you're aware of something in research, you could possibly bring that to your lab and do a validation on it and get published. So always being aware of what's out there, um, looking at what other labs do, and just being up to date on that is, is really important. All right, thank you, Sarah, um, for all the great information for our students. Um, we're gonna transition now into um, another trivia question. So out of these very important skills, which one is most valued by our local CEOs? Communication, collaboration, or critical thinking? What do our local Phoenix area CEOs value the most? All right, very interesting, we're split. All right, critical thinking has taken the lead. So um, our Valley CEOs believe that communication is the most important skill. Um, so very important to, to keep in mind communication and always developing those communication skills with others. So now I am pleased to, to welcome our fourth speaker, Javai Harris with Maricopa Community Colleges. She will discuss what education options for each of these areas looks like after high school. Welcome and thank you. Thank you, Matt. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as we share, my name is Javay Harris from Maricopa Community Colleges. Maricopa Community Colleges is the largest community college in our nation. Um, and with Maricopa Community Colleges, we have 10, um, campuses and two skill centers, which are named after each city that they live in. So what you see here is we have over 49 healthcare programs throughout our district. And so this highlights all of our programs, well, majority of our programs that are hosted at each one of our campuses. 
um, what you see is Gateway Community College is our pretty much our mecca for our healthcare programs. Um, and we offer programs throughout our district from veterinarian technology to vet tech to um, sonography to EMT to um, RN. Um, and we do also offer a few concurrent enrollment programs where you can obtain your bachelor's um, degree through our um, partnerships with some of our university and colleges that are local. If you could go to the next slide, please. So here what you see is our graduate numbers um, from 2018. Um, I highlight these programs because our top programs throughout our entire district are these programs that you see. Um, our registered nurse program is our top program throughout our district and so is EMT ranking in number two. Um, and we are very proud of this because our nursing program, in nursing you have to obtain a license um, to practice once completion of a program. And our program, we have the number one pass rate in the state of Arizona for um, first time pass rates for students to receive their um, certif certifications in nursing. If you can go to the next slide, please. So I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about internships and shadowing and what work-based learning looks like. So in the healthcare field, typically um, in the curriculum, there is built-in clinical experiences, internships, and shadowing that's offered. So throughout your program, you will be gaining the um, work-based experience throughout your program. For example, in Maricopa, for our nursing program, our students began in their first semester, in their first block, learning and doing what nurses do in the hospital. They're actually put into a hospital where they learn those clinical experiences. And by obtaining those experiences, you're able to network and gain the knowledge that you will learn firsthand. Um, and we're very proud of that because every program does not offer that in the beginning of their program. So internships and shadowing is not an internship such as other programs, like if you were going to school to obtain your business degree, you would probably complete your um, classroom expectations in the beginning of the program and then go out and get an internship or a shadowing experience. In the clinical world, in the healthcare world, you typically do that concurrently while obtaining the knowledge in the, um, in the classroom. Next slide, please. So some of the skills that are needed to be successful in the healthcare field. Um, we, we want our students to have strong interpersonal skills, which is empathy, communication skills, and teamwork. Also those skills, those personal skills as well, which honestly, in my opinion, these are not soft skills. These are skills that are needed um, to just be successful in any career specifically healthcare. And so you want to have that great work ethic, that flexibility, that time management, confidence um, in what you do. Because as what we're seeing right now in today's society, dealing with pandemic, you know, these workers are on the front line and the, these skills are what are, are making us be able to um, be safe and hopefully come out of this thing um, on the other side in regards to COVID-19. Um, so also the top skills for abilities, just to reiterate, having um, that critical thinking, that technical skill, being an active listener um, is very important um, into your success of being a healthcare um, professional. You can go to the next slide. 
So some things that you want to focus on in preparing for college, and this is not just for healthcare programs, but in general, you wanna research the campus that you're gonna be obtaining. Like I stated before, in Maricopa, we have 10 different campuses. Each one of our colleges are singly accredited. Um, so each one has their own culture. You wanna research the program requirements and also re research those state and national requirements for your career and choosing what degree or certification you would like to obtain. Then you would like to meet with a um, advisor or career navigator. And the difference between an advisor and career navigator, we have both in Maricopa. The advisor will help you in selection of your classes. And the career navigator will really guide you from beginning to end um, of your program in helping you obtain those milestones. So once you complete the program, you can be prepared for the workforce because that's our ultimate goal is preparing you with the knowledge to be successful to go into the workforce. Um, some of the requirements, you can skip over to the next slide. So some of those requirements for the healthcare program um, is that you will need to complete a CPR card, a level one fingerprint clearance card. Your immunization records have to be up to date because as shared with you previously, you will be going to a clinical experience internship and shadowing throughout our healthcare programs. So when you're in those facilities, they're treating you as if you are an employee, a future employee, so you have to make sure that you have these things because that's what their requirements are for their employees as well. Um, you will have to complete a certified background check and a urine drug screening as well. You'll also, before being placed into our program, you would complete a reading and math test as well um, for our program to know where we can place you in the beginning as far as your general education requirements. Some other things that you will have to look forward to in the healthcare careers, and this is across the board for most colleges um, and universities, is you will have to complete, you will have to have a strong background in um, the sciences, right? So biology, um, chemistry, um, you will have to take um, some programs, you have to take anatomy and microbiology in those courses as well. So this is just to name a few. Go to the next slide. Um, so I'm sorry I had to run through this very quickly, but I'm looking forward to any questions that you may have and just know that you can make it happen at Maricopa Community Colleges. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I just wanna thank everybody for being part of our panel today. Um, we really truly appreciate uh, supporting students at the Academy of Southbound High School and, and the very valuable information that you've shared. Um, we now have Q&A, an opportunity for questions. And so um, Casey has kindly um, taken some of the questions that come through and um, sent them to me. So the first is uh, for our panel. So aside from math and science, what other subjects should our high school students um, really be focusing on or become really relevant as they get into the career fields that you shared? So if you'd like to answer, feel free to unmute and, and share what other subjects are really relevant within your career field. I'll share something, um, just a couple. Anything with um, communication um, or and or um, leadership also, if, especially if you want to move up in the laboratory. Um, and many people here have actually gotten their MBA after their um, bachelor's. So that can be just, that can be used in a different aspect in a leadership skill. Um, so any courses geared towards like an MBA, um, communication and leadership, I would say. Would be I, would, the lab. I would echo Sarah. Um, MBAs are always great to see um, in partnership with your pharmacy degree, um, especially if you want that leadership position down the road. I would also definitely encourage you guys to take a language, specifically Spanish. It's something that is a big initiative with CVS and across the country right now is we need more Spanish speaking pharmacists um, within the country. So that would definitely help set you apart if you guys are interested in, in pursuing a language as well.
Great, thank you. So another uh, one more question that came through. So if you could go back and give advice to your high school self, um, just knowing what you now know about your career fields, what bit of advice would you give? I, I think I, I even give my own teenager this advice right now is, is try to do as many internships as possible. Um, get that exposure to the different kinds of settings and industries uh, that you're interested in and, and, and find out what you're really passionate about. Um, and, and then, you know, maybe take that additional, um, you know, courses towards what you really enjoy. Um, Cause I, I think that's where you can really uh, become happy and enjoy it. And um, those are the ones that really excel is, is when they, they really love and, and enjoy what they're doing. So take that time to do internships or shadows and uh, get that exposure. I would probably give myself the advice to go back and, and take that extra Spanish class. Um, I took a couple in high school, but not in college. And I know that that's a, a big thing that I'm, I'm always kicking myself for not, you know, minoring in Spanish. So that would be my biggest advice to myself going back. Well, thank you, panel. Um, that is all the time that we have this afternoon. Um, again, really thank you from, from all of our students and our community members for the Academy of South Mount High School. We really appreciate you spending time here sharing about um, yourself and your career fields. Um, there will be a, um, the, the recording of this webinar is going to be available. And so for our students and instructors, um, this will be available to, to, to view later on. Um, and there'll be a quick survey about the webinar experience as well as well as any resources, um, the slides that were shared will also be available. So again, thank you all for joining us and we hope that you will be well. Goodbye.